video. I'm ready to get going out here. We have a screen door porch at our house. And, and a few years ago, I had a cat that met a squirrel at that door almost every day. Now, there was no hissing. They just stared at each other and talked sweetly to each other. And, and I was personally getting worried because I'm sure the squirrel's intentions were noble, but you still got to wonder. And maybe the squirrel might not be the best of influence on my cat. I mean, after all, the Bible says this, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Okay, okay, I know that probably doesn't apply to cats and squirrels. But every parent in here who has ever worried about who your kids are hanging out with, you know it most definitely applies to people. We're finishing up a series on balancing our lives. This is the last one. We looked at mental balance, physical balance, spiritual balance, emotional balance. Today we're going to look at social balance. We're going to look at balancing our friends. The Bible says a mirror reflects a man's face. But what he is really like is shown by the kind of friends he chooses. You know, there's a website called rentafriend.com. Seriously, you can go rent somebody to go to the movies with you. You can rent somebody to go to the mall with you. Now, this is not a date. It's not a dating service. There's nothing sexual about this at all. This is just pure companionship. God made us that way. Loneliness is not part of God's plan. God meant for us to have friends. In fact, there's, it's fair to say that Christianity is based on this huge concept called community. People together in unity. You have two kinds of friends in your life. You have casual friends. And they are the result of the circumstances you're in. Maybe you go to church with them. Maybe you go to the PTA with them or whatever that's called these days. Maybe you live in the same neighborhood. Maybe you work together. But this is a good group of casual friends. But you also have a group of close friends. And these are people you have chosen. Because you cannot be close friends with every person in this world. And the closer I am to another human being, the more they have an influence on who I am as a human. Therefore, I need to choose my friends carefully. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, I thought we were supposed to love everybody with the love of Jesus. And I would certainly agree with you on that. We are. We should love and accept every person as Jesus loves and accepts them. But now read your Bible. We're a people of the book, they called us. Jesus loved all of his disciples, but there were three that he hung out with more than the others. And there was one out of all 12 that was called the disciple that Jesus loved. Jesus and him got along so well together that he even got the reputation of Jesus maybe just paying a little more attention to him than some of the others. Now, yeah, let's make sure we understand this. We are to be friendly, we're to be caring and concerned about everyone we meet. Because out of that huge crowd of people, we will become casual friends with a lot of them. And they will be with us, maybe in some situations, all of our lives. But from that group, we will choose our closest, dearest friends. Now, on to the second problem subject. The Bible says we should avoid some kinds of people. Now, I know some people got a little red flag going, whoa, whoa, I thought we were supposed to love everybody in the love of Jesus. Well, we are, but listen to this. Lazy people should be avoided. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle, lazy, and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. Angry people should be avoided. Do not make friends with a hot-headed, hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. Greedy people should be avoided. A greedy man brings trouble to his family. Unbelievers should be avoided. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship does light and darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Another word for the devil. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? <coughs> time out, time out. I have heard so many preachers try to prove something so very, very wrong with these verses that I just got to tell you, probably what you've heard these verses mean don't mean that. Let me tell you what the verses mean. They come from a situation in Corinth, and we talked about Corinth last Sunday. Not a bunch of really mature people. They became Christians, but they didn't want to stop doing all the stuff they did when they were not Christians. And Paul says, how can you become a Christian and then go back and start hanging out and doing all those non-Christian things you did before you became a Christian? In fact, Paul even says more about this. Just to make those verses clear, let me give you five. You should avoid believers who act like unbelievers. Now here's Paul's answer to that kind of controversial last scripture. He says, well, I wrote to you before. I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I was not talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin, or are greedy, or cheat people, or worship idols. You would have to leave the world to avoid people like this. I meant you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, or is greedy, or worships idols, or is abusive, or is a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it's certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. Now, that would probably be another great sermon in and of itself, but he's simply saying this. People, I didn't tell you to us avoid unbelievers in the world. You can't live in this world and not deal with unbelievers. You would have to leave the world not to have unbelievers in your life. What I said, but apparently didn't get it across to you, was stop associating with believers who still want to act like an unbeliever. And the truth is, the vast majority of people we know have not made the decision to follow Jesus. They're unbelievers. And like Paul said, it's not my jo job to judge these people. That's between them and God. It is my responsibility to love them with the love of Jesus. But I can't follow their behavior. Classic example is Jesus Christ. He hung out with tax collectors, the most crooked of crooked businessmen in the first century, and prostitutes which did the same thing in the first century they do in the 21st century. He loved them. He hung out with them. But obviously he did not share in their behavior. But don't miss a point. Paul is saying that we in the church ought to live to a higher standard. And when you become a Christian, when you become a member of a church, you are in fact saying, everybody else... I want you to help me like to live like a, a Christian. I want you to hold me to a higher standard. I want you to get on my case 
if I'm doing something I really shouldn't be doing. Well, what kind of friends do you need in your life? Here's number one. You need friends who stimulate you mentally. He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Friends are part of your educational experience. You will probably learn more from the friends around you than you will from the schools you attend. So have some friends that make you think. Have some friends that make you a better person. Have some friends that support you emotionally. It says a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. You know, a friend is somebody who walks in when others walk out. And a friend is somebody who's there when the going does get tough. Paul would say in the, in the New Testament, carry each other's burdens. And that's how you fulfill the law of Christ. You can count on your friends. They're going to support you emotionally. They're going to make you think. And number three, they're going to stimulate you spiritually. Paul says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. We all need fellowship. But there is a difference between friendship and fellowship. Friendship is based on how you feel about someone else in this world. Friendship is based on what you might have in common with someone else in this world. But fellowship is based on a shared vision, a shared common goal, a joint dream, the fellowship, the Lord of the Rings. You can be friends with unbelievers, and you will. That's how they become believers. But you cannot have fellowship ultimately with unbelievers because they do not have the life values that you should have if you're a believer. So, now we come to the message. <laughs> but it's a short message. Suggestions on how to balance your friendships. Number one, for you to really have some decent friends, you have to be a friend. Solomon says, people who do not get along with others are interested only in themselves. They will disagree with what everyone else knows is right. Now, I hate to say, be honest, but the reason a lot of people don't have many friends in life is because they don't particularly want that many friends in their life. I think there's been a time in all of our lives where we said, I don't need other people in my life. I don't want other people telling me what to do. And hopefully as we have grown and we have matured, we have come to the point where we now know the truth. We really do need to have some close friends in our lives. But sometimes it just doesn't happen. And people choose to remain in their own selfish world, and they focus only on themselves. Now, whether it's selfishness or self-centeredness, if you're struggling with those, you're, it's a guarantee you're going to be lonely in life. Paul says, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's suggestion number one. Learn to be a better friend. Number two is start smiling. For a lot of people, the room lights up when they leave it. Now, I hope that's not you, but it is for a lot of people. You know, it takes six muscles to smile. It takes 42 muscles to frown. You keep frowning all your life, it's wasting a lot of your own energy. It's amazing when people smile. It's kind of like a universal language. It, it communicates exception. Even the Bible says a happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. 
Now, this is just an opinion, but I think a sourpuss Christian kind of embarrasses God. And here's a practical truth, and I preach it to me just about every, every other day. If you're always complaining, if you're always griping, if you always have an ache or a pain, if there is always something wrong with you, or if there is always something wrong with this world around you, you're not going to have a whole lot of friends. Now, yeah, I know we all have problems. We all have heartbreaks. But at the same time, it's what we do with it. Man went into a floral shop. He was really complaining, chewing the florist out big time. And they had mixed up the flower deliveries. He said, I came inside to, to, to my friend's house. You know, he just got a brand new house. And I looked at the flowers, and the flowers said, rest in peace. <laughs> and the florist, who obviously had a good sense of humor, well, she said, well, you're really lucky. Can you imagine there's a, gra a graveside somewhere out there with another bouquet says, good luck in your new location. <laughs> Look, there's always something to gripe about if you want to gripe. But nobody likes us when we whine. Let's learn a positive attitude. Smile a little bit. Number three, this is a tough one. Learn to listen. Dear brothers, take note of this. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. That is probably the number one principle in communication, listening. You know the problem with that? We don't want to listen. We want to talk. Experiment. If you're brave, at the next church party or event, find someone who is a total stranger to you. Don't even have to be a church. Anywhere. Go up to that person and have them start talking about themselves for 20 minutes. Now, I mean, you don't say a single word about yourself. You don't even tell them your name. Focus the entire 20 minutes on who they are, what they do, who their kids are, what the kids are doing. Learn, draw them in, and then just walk away. And I will guarantee you that they will think you're the most intelligent person at that party. They're going to say, that guy was so nice because you didn't talk about yourself. Listening is the key to conflict resolution. Stephen Covey, if you've read some of his books, he says, seek first to understand, then to be understood. I have taught a lot of people how to be small group teachers, leaders. That's just part of my dissertation. And I will tell you that one of the absolute most difficult things to teach somebody else is to listen. Paul Turnay says it's impossible to overemphasize the immense need humans have to be really listened to. So start listening to people. Don't be critical. The scripture says up there, accept one another as Christ has accepted you. Stop trying to change people you haven't even begun to meet yet. You don't even know them. Just listen with openness. Listen with expectedness or expectancy. Expect to hear something. And that's tough because what are we doing when you're talking to me? I'm not listening. I'm thinking what I'm going to say when you finally stop talking. Therefore, when I start talking, I have not heard a single word you have just told me. That's husbands and wives. That's why you fight all the time because you don't listen to each other. You know, you just got to make sure your zinger is a little bit better than his zinger and whatever. <sighs> try to listen with empathy, where you try to feel what they're feeling. Try to resist the temptation to put a label. You know, a lot of people, after two minutes of talking, they say, oh, that's just a, yep, yep, yeah, just a, I put him in his box. Resist that. And just altogether, just resist the temptation to make judgments. Listening is really, truly that important. Number four, 
commit to what is best for each other, to build each other up. Paul says, encourage one another and build each other up as a fact you are doing. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. 1937, Dale Carnegie, Carnegie. Which one is it? Carnegie? Carnegie? Well, whatever. He wrote a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It became one of the best sellers of all time. It still is a bestseller. As of this morning, he has sold 30 million copies. And it's just about how to be a friend. Near the end of the book, he lays out an exciting principle about what he discovered. And you've got to understand this. He talked to thousands of people. He hired researchers to go in libraries and read books about great people. Together, him and one other researcher read 400 biographies of Teddy Roosevelt. And his conclusion, I'm going to read it to you. It's just a sentence. Philosophers have been speculating on the rules of human relationships for thousands of years. Out of all that speculation has evolved only one principle. It's not new. It's old as history. Jesus taught it among the stony hills of Judea 19 centuries ago. Jesus summed up in one thought, probably the most important rule in the world, do unto others as you'd have them do to you. Friendship means that kind of commitment. And it's going to take time. It's going to take some togetherness. You'll go through triumphs and trials. But the final scripture says two are better than one because they have a good return for the work. One falls down. His friends can help him. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Take the chance to become a better friend. Take a chance to become happy, positive. Now listen, no one here has a perfect situation. There's plenty of rain in every life here today. But whether we dwell on the good or whether we dwell on the bad, that's our choice. And that's going to make a world of difference, not just in how we feel, but in how we get along with other people. And as you try being a better friend, come on down, praise team. Why don't you start trying to really listen to each other? Honestly, is that important? And it would be far less disagreements and debate if we really did listen and then say what we want to say. You have to make that kind of commitment. It doesn't happen automatically. You need to treat other people the way Jesus would treat them. You'll have a lot of friends. You'll be a great witness to the unbelievers around you. You will be a, an encouragement to the believers in your life. And in the process, you're going to be a much more balanced person. I'd like you to stand and share one final song with us this morning.